Anyway, good morning, everybody. Oh, welcome uh, to the healthcare transition um, workshop. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Mario Gaspar de Alba, who is the developmental and behavioral pediatrician of Nevada. He's the only one, and he has a wealth of information for us today. So um, he is speaking from Vegas this morning. And thank you all for being on Zoom. Thank you all for being here in Reno and in Vegas. And Mario, you can take it from here. Right. So I was instructed to stand here in the middle of the room. So this, so this is where I will be. Sorry, you guys will put my back to you most of the time. So I'm Mario Gaspar de Alba. I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician. I uh, see patients down here in Las Vegas and for early intervention in Reno uh, one day a month. So I'm familiar with most parts of the state. Um, thank you for being here and I hope, uh, hope this is uh, useful for you all. So um, soy el doctor Mario Gaspar de Alba, soy pediatra del desarrollo y comportamiento. Eh, trabajo principalmente aquí en Las Vegas, pero también veo pacientes en Reno una vez por mes. Um, eh, gracias por acompañarnos y espero que sea útil para ustedes. Okay, let's start the slides. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I want this to be uh, informal, really, a, a discussion more than anything. I have some information to present, um, but if any questions come up, please don't hesitate to, to interrupt, raise your hand, get somebody's attention, and we'll stop and talk. Um, quiero que esta presentación sea más informal. Si hay alguna pregunta o quieren eh, parar y, y discutir algo, lo podemos hacer. Okay, so we're, we're gonna talk about healthcare transitions for youth with special healthcare needs. Um, and this topic is something that I've realized over my career that it's really not something that comes up until it's an immediate need, which means when a youth is about to transition out of their pediatrics doctor's office. Um, este es un, un tema de, de cual eh, me he notado que típicamente no lo platicamos hasta que es el momento donde un, un joven necesita transicionar a, a otro doctor por su edad. So let's go to the next slide. So healthcare transition really just means it's a process of changing from a pediatric model to an adult model of healthcare. Entonces esta transición es solamente el proceso de cambiar de una forma eh, un modelo de cuidado médico de pediatría adulto, porque es bastante diferente. So this, this tr transition, this, these two medical systems are quite different. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about a few ways how they are different. Um, so here we see uh, a lot of comparisons between pediatric and adult healthcare models, um, and, and they are quite different. Um, si notan en la, en la tabla aquí, se ven muchas diferencias entre el cuidado médico de, de, en pediatría y el modelo que se usa para adultos. So I just thought we'd go through uh, a couple of these. In the pediatric model, uh, really we're very, I say we because I'm a pediatrician, we're very worried about growth and development. Uh, we're worried about all these changes that are happening all along this, this continuum. And that's why, um, children with special health care needs get a lot of attention from us because these are things that come up in pediatrics in the process of growth and development. Whereas in adults, we're really in a maintenance stage. We're just kind of taking care of what's happening and then uh, problem solving as we get older. Uh, in, in el sistema pediátrica, estamos preocupados acerca del desarrollo, el crecimiento de niños. Entonces, por eso en esta especialidad o este modelo, estamos preocupados porque es cuando vemos todos los cambios eh, de niños que necesitan más ayuda o que tienen una demora del desarrollo por cualquier razón que nos damos cuenta y estamos trabajando con ellos durante toda la época de, de ese crecimiento. Ya en el sistema de adultos realmente estamos solamente viendo eh, qué está pasando con la salud, manteniendo salud y viendo qué pasa con edad. So the focus is very different um, in these things. In, in, in the practice approach, 
because it has to be in pediatrics, it's family centered. So there's a shared decision making with the parents, the caregivers, um, because the child really isn't in a position to be able to make those informed decisions. Um, whereas in on the adult side, it's patient centered. So the patient is responsible for helping to come to the healthcare decisions made for them. Eh, en el sistema pediátrica, el, se enfoca en la familia o en aquellos que están cuidando al niño para ayudar a hacer decisiones por ellos porque el niño no puede. En adultos, es, cambia al paciente. El paciente necesita ser parte de esas decisiones. In the, I'm just going to skip down, uh, primary care, it's, it's basically usually healthy in pediatrics. And in adults, we only go to the doctors when we're not feeling well. So, but kids are supposed to go all the time. Eh, en cuidados primarios, se nota la diferencia en que niños van cada rato. O sea, es, eh, deben de ir al principio cada seis meses y luego cada año. En adultos, realmente no vamos si no estamos enfermos. In, and this is an important point because this, this is how we access healthcare in where our clinics are. So in pediatrics, most of the specialty clinics are going to be located in in a hospital or in a place where there are other specialists. Um, with adults, these specialty practices are, are usually spread out. They're, they're in different places. They're not usually housed under the same roof or the same building unless it's an academic center. Um, in la clinica, en donde se encuentran los cuidados en pediatría, típicamente los especialidades se, se están en un lugar todos juntos. En adultos, todos los especialistas están en diferentes oficinas, en diferentes áreas, eh, pero eh, con la excepción si es parte de una, un centro académico. In pediatrics, you know, we're, we're used to having um, referrals to other places, to other practitioners, uh, other specialists or other ancillary therapies, speech, OT, uh, physical therapy, um, counseling, we're just used to having that. And, and because we have that, there's more care coordination. So there are people in the office who are meant to help families to find these extra services that are going to be recommended. On the adult side, it's pretty unusual. Uh, pretty unusual to have uh, these, these specialty connections, uh, unless, unless the patient has a chronic condition. And it's even more unusual to have anybody in an adult patient office that actually does care coordination. Um, that's a very specialized clinic. In, in pediatría, typically in las oficinas, se ve que hay eh, la habilidad y porque hay más frecuencia de referir a otros especialistas y también a otras terapias como habla ocupacional o físico. Por esa razón, en esas mismas oficinas se encuentra alguien o, o personas quien pueden ayudar a la familia a encontrar estos servicios y llegar a conseguir los servicios. Cuando eh, en una clínica de adultos típicamente no hacen eh, ese tipo de referencias si el adulto no está, está bien o si no está muy enfermo, tiene un problema crónico. Pero eh, por esa razón igual no hay nadie en esas clínicas típicamente que ayudan a ese adulto a encontrar y, y llegar a esos servicios. En pediatrics, the appointments tend to be longer, although to be honest, they're not, they're not that much longer. Uh, in primary care, in specialty care, they do tend to be longer uh, than adults. Adults in specialty care, they, their points tend to be shorter, but primary care is pretty consistent between the two. So it's a, it's a big difference. It's a big difference that switches on a focus and support uh, between pediatric and adult. Um, in el sistema pediátrico, las citas typically duran más tiempo que en adultos. Y este, este, si ven todas estas diferencias, es importante porque el enfoque es, cambia totalmente de la familia al individuo y el apoyo es muy diferente. Hay mucho más apoyo en pediatría que, que hay para adultos. Ok, let's go to the next one. Ok, so what are the goals of transition, right? And I think... 
every family is going to have their own goals. Every youth is going to have their own goals. Um, so these are these are kind of baseline foundational goals. Um, cuando estamos hablando de metas en transición, cada joven, cada familia va a tener sus metas. Estas aquí son realmente en general que se debe enfocar en, en, en estas metas de transición. So the first is just to improve the ability of the youth and the young adult to manage their own health care, really, and effectively use health services because they're going to need to. And uh, this, is, this is a need that they're going to have throughout their lifespan. So it's important to help them learn and be able to do these things. The second is to ensure organized clinical process in that transition, which helps with preparing the youth and the family to transition, to actually make the transition, and then to start integrating into the adult care model that I just mentioned, because it is very different. In estas metas, la primera realmente es para ayudar a, a niños a mejorar la habilidad de manejar su propio salud y efectivamente usar servicios de salud, porque es muy diferente. Segundo, es eh, asegurar que hay un proceso en, en la práctica pediátrica para mover, hacer esa transición que incluye preparación, la transición y luego la integración de ese paciente en el sistema de adultos. Okay. How are we doing? Anybody have any comments or questions? No. Right. Okay, I'll have some for you guys in a minute. <laughs> okay, so why are we talking about transition? If it's something that happened, it was really easy. Maybe we wouldn't have to talk about it so much, but we have a problem. <laughs> so uh, according to the 2020-2021 National Survey of Children's Health, um, in looking at data for kids 12 through 17, the majority don't meet the national healthcare transition performance measure. Okay. So if you look at the numbers, 84% uh, of youth with special healthcare needs do not meet national healthcare transition performance measures. But <laughs> for good or for bad, nobody does really because youth without special needs also don't get any transition services. Um, so it's just a problem across the board. We don't transition youth well from a pediatric model to an adult healthcare model. And by youth, I will include families. <laughs> eh, lo que estamos viendo aquí es que hay un problema. En 2020 al 21, eh, se hizo un estudio viendo la transición de niños de 12 a 17 años a, un, a, a cuidados para adultos. Y lo que vieron fue que 84% de los jóvenes con necesidad especial en salud no recibieron esa ese ayuda, esa transición pero realmente tampoco otros niños que no tenían las mismas necesidades tuvieron este servicio. Entonces, realmente en todos no lo estamos haciendo bien. Ok. Ok. So, th this, is, this is basically the transition team. Um, and I think this covers, this covers most people. Um, I did leave one group out, and, and I'll ask you all if you think this is an important group that should be included. Um, and we're talking about a healthcare transition team. So the, the young person themselves, the parents of the caregivers, the primary care physician, any specialty care providers that are involved, and then any other healthcare therapy providers like speech, PT, OT, um, that don't see both kids and adults. Entonces, el equipo de transición, quizás para cada familia va a ser un poquito diferente. Aquí hay una lista de todos lo que, los que yo pienso deben de ser parte de ese equipo. Um, no incluye un grupo y realmente me interesa saber si ustedes piensan que sería bueno incluirlos. Ahorita les pregunto. Pero este equipo incluye la, el paciente, el joven, eh, sus papás o los que lo cuidan, el pediatra y eh, los proveedores especiales, los especialistas que también trabajan con el niño y otros especialistas que hacen las terapias, que trabajan principalmente en pediatría. So, does anybody have any idea of who might be missing or an idea of somebody you think should be included in the team? Well, I'm thinking of someone from the education team. 
Yeah. I mean, that's the missing piece because a lot of times they work in silos, but mm -hmm. there's such an overlap, especially mm -hmm. if the kiddos are looking to, you know, post-secondary education, you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you really need that component. For sure. So, so Marsha brings up a good point. The, the, the people I left off here were really the, the IEP team. And it's, I think it, I think it, may depend on how how they're involved because I as I look at it through healthcare, um, as she mentioned, it, it is it is pretty siloed. And we've not done a good job in um, communicating between the medical and healthcare teams and the school teams where where often that would be really beneficial because the health issues that the child has outside of school, they also have in the school. <laughs> um, as they transition out of the school system, um, the IEP team may have some good ideas about assistance that the youth may need as they move into a, a post-secondary education. So that would be a good, a good group to include. Those are tough silos to break down and I'm open to suggestions on, on how to do that. I, I will say I have not been successful in, in having discussions with uh, Clark County School District. Um, eh, el grupo que no se incluyó aquí es el grupo de la escuela, el, lo, el equipo del IEP, porque ellos tienen información de cómo los problemas de salud o las necesidades de cada niño los afectan en su educación. Entonces, cuando un niño está cambiando del sistema educativo de la secundaria a universidad, otros estudios, ellos van a saber qué necesidades van a tener. Eh, que pueden ser no solamente educativos, pero pueden ser por su salud, por el problema de salud que tienen, eh, cómo se pueden apoyar estos niños en la nueva sistema educativa. Entonces sería bueno poder incluirlos, pero es, es, ha sido difícil tener esa comunicación entre el lado médico y el lado educativo. Mario, we've got uh, a wise parent over here who has some thoughts about connecting. Schools. Yeah, for sure. Love to hear it. Actually, it's it's not a suggestion about connecting school teams because we've been in our situation in our school for a while. Um, but as far as somebody else that I think should be on the transition team, since these classes have kind of been back to back, um, it's gotten me thinking about other people who have sage advice about caregiver or not caregivers. Um, positions and clinicians and other places that we can go, um, I would recommend that you add on their kind of your advisory team or whatever you want to call it, that you have, you know, when you're planning your special needs trust and the will and your family trust and things like that, I'm assuming we all would have some sort of advisory group that we can go to and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm stuck in this position and I don't know, does any of you know Maybe you've walked this path before me. Maybe you guys have a recommendation of a good dentist or a good therapist or, you know, I had brought up the other day, you know, to a group that nobody had ever heard of a, I think it's called a developmental pediatrician, a neuro neurological pediatrician. Um, so, you know, there's a, a lot of information that you can learn from other parents. So basically other parents, not just the family parents. So in case that wasn't totally heard, it was adding other parents and your support system to this. Yeah. Team. Yeah. yeah. And that makes sense. That makes sense. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that. I'll touch on that a little bit as we talk about actually finding the people that you're going to transition to because they are, they are an excellent resource, if not the most excellent resource. Thank you. We have another comment. Yeah. I think we should also consider our regional centers. Sierra Regional Center. They do attend IEPs when you need them to. That that comment was uh, connecting mm -hmm. regional centers. I, also. I realize that sometimes we, we don't get everything we need from them, but I think if we start kind of inviting them to more things, hopefully they, they may get more on board. Maybe take more ownership from mm -hmm. their case. Yeah. Right. So, so let me ask this. Let me just ask this follow-up question just for my own education. How, how would you see the regional centers helping on the healthcare side? How would you describe that? 
Well, what I want to say is they're part of the IEP team if you select to have them as part of your IEP team. Uh -huh. They go to bat for you. We've had them actually help us in IEPs. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So they're supposed to be watching this child. <laughs> right. This right. So I do feel like they should be filled in. Um, I'm not necessarily sure. You laugh. Well, maybe, well I, I think they laughing. should be in tune with the community and know who's available to help our children because they, they've been working with our children for more than a few days and that they know what our needs are, that, you know, one of our kiddos may need more help with epilepsy and another one may need more physical help and another one, you know. Well, and if nothing else, they can at least, hopefully, they can educate all of us on this team about what resources are available. Right, so I guess- And that's where we all kind of laugh. Right. Because it doesn't seem that they know. It's they should be on the forefront of, of funding too, as far as what's coming down the pipeline of those different things that they have set up for different groups to help us navigate our healthcare needs or whatever, like Medicaid waiver. Does everybody know what a Medicaid waiver is? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's Katie Beckett compared to the Medi Medicaid waiver? It might it might just be educational and maybe hand holding, but it would be nice if they were included and, and, yeah. and even wanted to jump in at some point. Yeah, I think a lot of us have been part of CR Regional Center since our kids were very little. Mm -hmm. So for them to follow the case, when when you get to a point like where Pam is, Carson is 21, 22 now, and um, and she needs lots of different supports from a healthcare perspective. And those you have to go through Sierra Regional Center to get. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, shared living provider and well, your PCA didn't come, but lots of lots of diapering, you know, lots of services from a healthcare perspective do mm -hmm. have to route through Sierra Regional Center. So maybe that would be the perspective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm I'm wondering how, just as a process, um, how we can include them more when the transition is starting to happen. You know, and you'll see later. You know, that really should start at about twelve, thirteen. But how how to in include them so that they're clear on their role? Because I, it sounds like they also need um, education in this area, Very right? Much. So what? that they can be a better resource. Okay, one more comment. I, I, this is Judy Ishibashi, and I don't know, I, I think I know most of you guys, but um, I'm not the parent of a child with special needs. I'm an aging, aging <laughs> occupational therapist, but I think that what we have been meeting, and most of the people here in Reno that are here are part of like a parents group or a mixed group. It's, it's parents and professionals all together, but when I think Pam was talking about an advisory committee. There is so much knowledge from these parents that have been in the system for so very long and new parents coming in with new things that are coming up together. Mm -hmm. that there's such a wealth of knowledge um, over and beyond what we professionals have. Mm -hmm. It needs both. And I think the more diversity that you have on your advisory committee, the more um, the more successful you're going to be. Because right now we kind of put people into boxes and we only include certain boxes into the advisory or the leadership part. And, and this diversity of parents, diversity of color, diversity of, of, of specialties, it needs to be a diverse group to do this properly, I think. Yeah, no, agreed. Yeah, I think the, the more experience that's at the table, then the better that they can advise, right? And everybody has a little bit different experience. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd love to hear the, the strategies of how to get all those people together in a way to help a, a you specific just, you family. Put it out there, they're, they're willing to come. I mean, our group is getting almost too big to handle um, <laughs> because there is such a need and especially post COVID when so many places have closed, those mm -hmm. people that are caught in the transition are absolutely yeah. desperate for need, but so are the new parents just coming in now. Oh, yeah. you put your shingle out there and let them know that there are people that are competent 
and interested and you won't be able to you won't be you'll have more than you need we have we share more information among parents yes that you can possibly believe that you know you come to one meeting and go oh my gosh i'm leaving here with with so much new knowledge it's it's, yeah. over, it's overwhelming and there's so many side conversations going on i mean there are gazillion side conversations going on all at once and we tried to add maybe a little structure and mm -hmm. then we're, because <laughs> there's so many diverse needs that they just come and yeah. they they put it together the way they put it together i think on my jill i think on my case as as i'm sitting here thinking about say regional center in, in plain view i think it, a lot of it has to do with getting access to those new parents and letting them know that there is a serial regional center first of all getting the kids established in that and and i think that if the new parents knew that there's these resources that possibly could be there that C original that is so supposedly supposed to have the education and and supply for it and i think if parents demanded and got C original center more involved with their kids cases and asked them to ieds and maybe some medical doctor's appointments and actively in, included them in decision making and support that I think that the that the wildfire would get out kind of is what I'm thinking that C original center would hopefully would want to step up a little bit more um, across the board, not only for our kids, but the smaller kids too coming in. I mean, it's really, I think a lot of the education is is the, the the smaller new baby parents that are coming in um, with their special needs kids as well. Yep. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Why it, it sounds like maybe this is a, a family navigation network <laughs> goal to, it, it sounds like maybe have a, uh, a group of advisory council members that would be willing to meet with families right, whether it's north or south or rural or both or all, um, to have that as a, as a resource, as an, ac an access point for parents, either new parents coming in or parents transitioning into adult health care. So I'm going to leave that with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did to you do want that. to summarize that in Spanish? Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, in, in el equipo ese de transición, se sugirió que también se incluyera el sistema escolar Uh, también otros, otras familias que han eh, caminado este camino, que ellos saben, basado en sus experiencias, um, cómo, dónde se puede buscar ayuda, dónde se encuentra ayuda, um, también incluyendo los centros regionales. Eh, desde el principio, para, aunque ellos quizás a veces no ofrecen o parece que no ofrecen mucha ayuda, eh, si los podemos involucrar más, ellos igual pueden ayudar y ser más efectivos en las ayudas que ayudan a las familias y en, en este proceso también de, de transición. Um, platicamos un poco acerca de el, the Family Navigation Network haciendo un, uh, quizás un consejo de, para, de familias o de especialistas que pueden ser disponibles a hablar con familias cuando tienen preguntas o están en este proceso. Okay. Okay. So this is a busy slide. So th this is really talking about the self-advocacy part of uh, healthcare transition. And these are just questions that I think might uh, at least start the conversation about preparation for transition, preparing the youth for transition to that adult healthcare model. So questions that families can ask themselves, um, you know, does your son or daughter know their diagnosis? Do they know the names of their medications? Do they know what the medications are for and what the side effects are um, and, and why they're important? Uh, can they describe their disability? Uh, can they express their needs or advocate for themselves? Do they understand physician's instructions and how? You know, do they understand better verbally? Do they understand better written? Is there another medium that, that they understand better? Can they be responsible for their own medications? And can they follow the directions of those medications? So these, these are meant to kind of start the discussion. And there's some handouts um, that I think everybody will get 
um, and, and I'll show you a table here in a second, um, that really focuses on knowing where your youth is at in this preparation process. Um, the, other, the other important point is not just where is the youth at, where are the parents at? or the caregivers at in this, uh, in this process. My, my experience has been that um, sometimes when the youth seems to be ready to start taking over, parents are not ready for the youth to start taking over. Um, they are afraid. Um, uh, they're not sure that the youth can do it. Uh, they're afraid to let go a little bit. And that's totally understandable because they've taken care of this child from the very beginning. Um, but that's an important step that has to be made, this kind of psychological shift for, for parents to make. Um, and that it's okay uh, to be okay with if they miss their medication <laughs> one morning or be okay with following up like, oh, looks like you didn't take it a couple hours ago, better take it. Um, but giving them that opportunity to, to figure that out. And then asking, uh, asking them or yourself, would a medical binder or some portable summary outlining their disability and their special health care needs be useful uh, for them? Is there any technology uh, that could be helpful in making appointments, reminding them to take their medication, or keeping track of their uh, contact information for providers? Is there something that they could navigate um, that would give them more tools in being able to take over their own health care? I have a, something to add here. Yeah. So um, my son has Down syndrome. My generation of parents who have Down syndrome in their family, um, somebody with Down syndrome in their family, we're the first generation that's going to outlive our, or their, our kids are going to outlive us. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I would also say that this part where you're setting up self-advocacy and record keeping includes a plan for what happens when you're not there. Mm -hmm. And that means that in my case, we have guardianship. And so we have a Dropbox set up for all three of the guardians we put all the medical records in there and answer a lot of these questions mm -hmm. so that if there is a transition that needs to be made, whether it's to living with a sibling or into a group home, mm -hmm. it's all in one place. It's all ready to go. Nobody needs to search for it. That's a great idea. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Okay, let's go to the, the next. Did you want to test some Spanish? The next is the, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it, Esta información realmente es para preparar a las familias o para que ellos puedan empezar a reconocer dónde está su hijo o hija en el proceso de poder tomar sobre sí mismos eh, es su cuidado médico. Eh, estas preguntas, si saben su diagnóstico, si eh, conocen qué medicinas están tomando y por qué, uh, y por qué es importante tomarlas, si pueden hablar acerca de su deshabilidad. Si pueden eh, pedir por la ayuda que necesitan, cuando lo necesitan. Si pueden entender las instrucciones de su doctor y en qué forma lo pueden entender. Si es escucharlo o leerlo o quizás de otra forma. Uh, y si ellos pueden ser responsables por tomar sus propias medicinas um, y seguir las instrucciones. Preguntar si sería útil tener eh, una, una hoja o un cuaderno o algo portátil que tiene toda la información de la disabilidad del niño um, y sus necesidades para que lo pueden llevar a cualquier lado o a cualquier proveedor. Y si hay tecnología que les pueden ayudar en, en um, tomar responsabilidad, hacer, hacer sus propias citas, recordarles de tomar sus medicinas y mantener una lista de, de información para contactar sus proveedores eh, médicos. Eh, se, se comentó también eh, una, una familia que esta generación ahorita que tienen hijos con síndrome de Downs eh, es la primera generación donde los niños probablemente van a vivir más tiempo que los papás. Entonces, eh, para los guardianes que, que van a tomar responsabilidad o parte de la responsabilidad de, estos, de estas personas, poder tener toda esa información en un lugar donde es accesible para, si, para que si algo pase, ya estos guardianes tienen toda la información que necesitan, no se tienen que ir buscando. Ok. So, the, this, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of this website. I, I imagine it's famous in these circles. This ScottTransition.org website. So, I just put up the two 
quizzes that they have on their website, one for one for parents and one for the patient themselves, uh, that you can kind of go through and see, well, where are we as a family, as a caregiver, as a parent in this transition process? And the other, where is our child in this transition process? How ready are they to transition? So these are great quizzes that you can take uh, on this website um, to kind of start looking at where you're at. Um, esta página es una página del internet donde tienen estas dos, eh, básicamente pruebas que adultos, eh, guardianes pueden tomar para ver dónde están ellos en, en el, la preparación para transicionar el niño a, a un sistema adulto. Y el otro es para acerca del niño que ellos pueden ver dónde están ellos mismos en, en el proceso. Y lo, lo bueno de estas dos cosas es que da información, ¿verdad? Información de, ok, ¿dónde estamos y qué necesitamos hacer para mejor prepararnos? De los dos lados, del lado del paciente y del lado de los, de los papás o los guardianes. Ok, so this is, this is something that's really for providers, but as families, I kind of want you to see where where you fit in um, and, and how you can help in this process, okay? So these are the three basic uh, action items in preparation for transition. Involving the patient in their care from early on, preparing the patient for transition with advance notice, and then connecting patients with new providers. So let's talk about the first one. Eh, esta lista de, de pasos son tres pasos que se necesitan hacer para empezar y para transicionar un paciente de un cuidado de pediatría una, a una, eh, un sistema para adultos. El primero, incluir el paciente en sus cuidados. El segundo, preparar los pacientes para la transición, avisándoles con tiempo que va a pasar. Y tres, conectando esos pacientes con nuevos proveedores. So involving patients in their care. So, so how do we do this? So as, as professionals, how are we taught to do this? So uh, first is to speak to the patient directly. Okay. So I, I'd, I'd like to see you guys, but I can't see you guys. <laughs> but maybe Maria can tell me. Um, how many in your pediatric care uh, did you find that your primary care provider, your specialty care providers spoke to your youth directly instead of you, or at least tried to? At times, yeah. I'd say we've got about three out of five here. Okay. I'd say almost always. <laughs> okay, okay, good, good. Um, the rest, or all of you, did you ever, did you ever recommend to your, to a healthcare provider to speak to the youth instead of to you? Did you redirect the questions from you to, to your youth when it was appropriate? Yes. Yes. Yeah, what I usually do is they're looking at me and I just look at Jack. That's a great strategy. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah. Then they'll usually kind of change their, who they're talking to. Yeah, that's a, that's a great strategy. Or if they ask a specific question and they're looking at me, I'll mm -hmm. say, well, Ian, what do you think? This is, you know, it's up to you, not yeah. to me. Yeah, that's yeah. great. How about in Reno? Any other strategies you've used? I Go ahead. I mean, it, it, not all of us have children that are able to respond. Right. So that's appropriate. Um, you know, the appropriate ones, I do the same thing. Whereas I look at Carson and say, Carson, what do you think? You know, is this something you want? Um, but I find I grab the doctor in the hall before they come oh. see us because there are certain things that I need to discuss with them that I don't want my son to know about because it will upset him. So mm -hmm. then the doctor will come in and knowing what not to say to him, ask the appropriate questions. That's yeah. good. No, that's great. That's great. And, and as a physician, I'll say that I very much appreciate that. Skippery? I have also, Skippery, pardon me now. Um, I have also uh, reminded uh, healthcare professionals that my daughter can understand everything you're saying, <laughs> and she she does prefer to be spoken to directly. So uh, I don't like it when it's of course none of us like it when we're talking about her. Like uh -huh. she understand, 
Um, so sometimes we we do have to, as parents, redirect. Some yeah. Things. Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. Because Big speaking child, you know, you need to remind them yeah. that that their uh, language is still very much present. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, even, even with even with the nonverbal patients, um, being nonverbal doesn't mean they are not understanding. Right. And that's a good place for parents to be able to to express that to new healthcare providers um, or remind old healthcare providers about what we're talking about that they understand. Right. They understand what's happening. Um, and I think it's it's a good reminder, and I don't think any healthcare provider would be offended by being reminded to pay more direct attention to to the patient. Um, I've I've found, and, and just because I was taught in my specialty that whether the patient is verbal, not verbal, seems to be responding or not responding, that the first person that I address when I come to the room is, is that patient. I say, hello, I bend down, I try to get their eye contact, you know, I might put my hand on them, just something to know that, so that they know that I'm interested in, in them. And then if, if they are not able to answer questions and we'll move forward with, with the parents. But this is something that families can be really helpful in helping healthcare providers at in, as the children get, child gets older and helping them know, no, you need to, you know, refocus on, on my, on my youth. Um, in, in. Mario, we've got a couple more comments over here. Sure. Let me translate what I just said first before okay. I forget. Go ahead. <laughs> eh, eh, involucrando pacientes en sus propios cuidados. El primer punto es que como eh, doctor o proveedor se necesita hablar directamente al paciente. No todos pacientes van a poder responder o no todos entienden, pero hacer el esfuerzo de hablar con ellos directamente y ustedes como papás eh, guardianes pueden hablar y, y explicar al doctor exactamente qué puede entender el paciente y eh, qué nivel, a qué nivel pueden comunicar con ellos. Um, igual de, de hablar o decirles al proveedor si hay cosas que no se deben de platicar en frente del paciente. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, this is Jill. I um, I have a 19 year old, a little, maybe a little bit different than situation than others. Shelby lives with some anxiety issues and I um, have learned with her, um, sometimes it's just easier to rip the bandaid off with for her as far as dealing with our anxiety issues about something that might be going on or we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I am a very much open, um, I don't sugarcoat much and talk directly into Shel to Shelby about things that are going on with her in front of her. One of the things that I will do is make Shelby tell the story, but if there's something else that might be important for the doctor to know, then I will look at Shelby and tell Shelby maybe tell the doctor this happened too so he gets that picture and yeah. i will her tell her side of the story no. but for shelby to process her anxiety and to get the whole picture it's easier for me to rip the bandage up and just yeah. go for the whole gusto with her yeah. and the doctor yeah and that's and that's a great strategy right and again speaking to the individuality of how you present this information to their providers right you know best what works for your child um, so not being afraid to share that with them uh, will definitely make the care go better. Was there another comment before I translate that? Yep. We have Judy. Well, I, 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 I'm coming from um, the other point of view because I'm a practitioner. I do not have a child with special needs, but I think all kids, every, all of us have special needs. I mean, I think we're just all diversely capable to be perfectly honest with you, but, um, I think that I, I do speak directly to the patient, but oftentimes I have to help parents understand that there are, there are so many nonverbal cues that can t let you know that these kids are comprehending and that they are listening. And like they'll stop and just listen or they'll just, where they're falling asleep and you start talking with somebody else, their eyes open up there are so many cues that a lot of times new parents especially 
don't understand that. The other thing is whenever I have a first meeting with, with, with parents with new patients, I never allow the parent to speak about a child's weaknesses or in quotation problems in front of the child because they are so aware of what how people are being judged. And an example is even a boy in middle school that he was having some issues. And I said, good grief, do you know how special you are? And he just collapsed. And I said to him, oh, just, oh, oh, like, what, what's happening? And he said, yeah, like special ed. And I said, absolutely not that. I am telling you, you are an incredible individual. But I mean, the negative, they get so exposed to the negative aspects that even when you're giving positive information, you need to make sure they're not interpreting it differently. And the other thing is that I find with really young kids, even as young as like two and three, I had a kid that was so anxious that was left with me and mom was out of the room and he wouldn't come near me. And I, a lot of times I find a whisper is stronger than a scream. And I just started whispering, oh my gosh, look how you are so incredible. And just talking about the most incredible things that I could think of about this child in a whisper. The child then came up and sat on my lap and then we got ready to go. But these kids from a very, very young age, they know negative things are being said about them. And especially at a young age, they need to be protected from that. Entonces, una mamá eh, reportó que para su hija era importante para ella por su ansiedad, dejar que la hija eh, explicara todo lo que está pasando con ella. Um, y a, ayudarla a dar toda la información necesaria al proveedor. En, en, y esa situación eh, muestra qué tan importante es la individual, individual, individual en la forma que cada persona se comunica, que los papás realmente sepan cómo su hijo o hija se puede comunicar y a, a, a qué grado, ¿verdad? Si pueden dar toda la información parte o nada, y luego los papás pueden ayudar a medida que es necesario. El otro comentario fue de eh, un proveedor que dijo que ella muchas veces enseña a los papás que aunque parezca que los niños no están comunicando, realmente tienen signos no verbales que, que indica que están entendiendo y que es importante siempre ser positivo en, en frente de ellos, hablar más de las cosas que pueden hacer que las cosas que no pueden hacer o de cosas negativas. The second point, um, as time goes on and as the, as the youth ages, increasingly shifting responsibility as the patient is able, uh, obviously with parent support and, and sometimes with very specific instructions for parents. Um, again, I, I just listed them some things, right? And some things that we've already mentioned. So, uh, the responsibility of reporting to the provider what's going on, uh, what's happened between the visits, of making decisions about continuing, not continuing medication, needing the therapy, not needing the therapy, um, and scheduling follow-ups. So again, this is very individual, right, as the patient is able with the parent support. So uh, as a parent, you are in the best position to be able to say, okay, my son or daughter can do this much and I, I will support them with the rest. But again, that goes back to that kind of psychological shift that I was talking about, being willing to, to push them a little bit to do maybe a little bit more than you think they could be able to do to see if, if they can step up and do it. And I think a lot of times parents are surprised. Um, and then always just always providing uh, that, that support as needed uh, so that they're successful in doing it. And as you, I think as parents allow their youth to do some of these things uh, and then step in, you get a good idea of, okay, how far can they go? How much can they do um, by giving them a little bit of space to, to do more? Um, el segundo punto es uh, a través del tiempo darle al paciente más oportunidad o más responsabilidad en las áreas de su cuidado médico, ¿verdad? Con ayuda de los papás o apoyo de los papás, incluyendo eh, instrucciones específicas cuando se necesitan para los papás. 
Porque con tiempo, el, el paciente debe de empezar a desarrollar la habilidad de reportar lo que está pasando con su salud, a ser parte de, de haciendo esas decisiones, incluyendo medicinas y terapias, hasta pudiendo hacer las citas para seguimiento. Muchas veces, eh, papás, como papás, queremos hacerlo porque sabemos que se va a hacer bien, pero hay que también darle espacio a... a ese joven, de tratar de hacer estas cosas, porque así van a ver qué tanto pueden hacer y darles un poco de espacio de, de tratar de hacerlo y desarrollar esas habilidades. Um, porque con tiempo, en tiempo, ellos lo van a tener que hacer. Ok. And then the last thing is giving written information. So written or, or other, any, really, I mean, anything other than verbal instruction or information. I think with for some patients, it is more useful for them to have something simply written that they can refer to um, later because sometimes it's difficult to remember what was said. Sometimes they didn't fully understand what was said. It allows families to be able to go back and look at that written information and be able to go over that again with their youth. So again, it, as a parent, I think this is another good place where you can help the provider know, okay, this is, this is the way my youth retains or receives information best. So that allows them to be able to provide information in that way, especially as they're, as they're aging, so that they can be more successful as you're shifting responsibility. Mario, really quick, there's just one more comment um, yeah. that, that since you are open to suggestions, yeah. the term now is, um, let's see, non-speaking is preferred these days to non-verbal because they have words, they just can't speak them. Okay, very good. Thank just you. Yes. yes. All right. Okay. En español. Oh. Um, le, eh, hubo una sugerencia que eh, en vez de usar el término no verbal, uh, usar el término que eh, no hablar porque pueden comunicar, pero quizás no pueden hablar. The second step in preparing patients for transition. Um, so, again, this is for providers. So, for, for families, just think about where you fit into this. So, letting the patient and the family know that their care will eventually need to transition to another provider. Um, and this is done sooner rather than later because then that allows time for questions and answering those questions. Um, because a lot of times you're not going to sit in the visit and have questions immediately, but you may have, you and your youth may have questions later. So you have to have time to have further visits to go over those questions. And then have a visit to just specifically to make a transition plan or to create a care summary for the person that they're going to transition to. Um, with the patient, the parent, and the provider together. So, el segundo paso de ayudar en la transición es preparar el paciente para la transición. Esto incluye eh, dejando saber al paciente y la familia que se va a necesitar hacer esta transición a otro proveedor. Pero con tiempo para que ellos pueden eh, formular y hacer preguntas y para que haya tiempo para responder a esas preguntas. Y quizás se pueda hacer una visita exclusivamente para hacer un plan de transición con la familia y con paciente. Esto pudiera incluir crear uh, una... Eh, oh, how do you say summary? Una, un resumen de todo el cuidado que, que el joven ha tenido desde ese momento con el proveedor que tiene para que lo pueden llevar al nuevo proveedor. Uh, The third point is to connect patients with the new provider. So as a healthcare provider, providing recommendations for somebody that can take over the care, right? And, and interestingly, and I think you guys have already brought it up, the healthcare provider may not be the best resource for this, but they might be. So it's worth asking. Um, and the, the provider uh, should be able to provide some some resources, right, for, for ongoing uh, healthcare and for services. 
um, the provider should provide that summary of care to a new provider. So that's why in the last step, I think it's worthwhile doing a visit where that's what you do. You create this summer, summary of care. And then uh, the provider should offer to provide follow support for a patient or the family if they're unhappy with the new provider, which can sometimes happen. Okay. El tercer paso es conectar familias o pacientes con un nuevo proveedor. Para el, el proveedor actual que tiene el paciente, ellos pueden recomendar otros proveedores que ellos sepan que pueden ayudar al paciente basado en sus necesidades. También ese proveedor que tienen debe de, de dar un resumen del cuidado que han tenido con ese proveedor para que lo pueden llevar. Por eso dije en el, en el segundo paso que se debe de hacer una cita para crear ese resumen. Y tercero, el proveedor actual puede ofrecer ayuda o apoyo al paciente o la familia si no están felices o conformes con su nuevo proveedor. No es solamente cortarlos y decir, ya se acabó conmigo. Ok. So, what else can parents do? So I, I think in those three basic steps, I, I think hopefully I, it came across clear what, what families could do to help in that process where those are things that, that providers are told that they need to do um, in, in your role as family, helping them actually get through those things because it doesn't always happen as we saw 84% of the time. Um, so these are just some ideas of things that, that you can do yourself. So finding out what the policies are uh, at your child's practice, what are the age limits, when, when will they be aging out? Because then that you can work back from that and start prompting your provider uh, to start doing those transition steps. Also asking your health healthcare insurer, because sometimes it's not up to the provider. Um, I, I know for me, I'm happy to see kids up to 26, but uh, a lot of healthcare insurers will not cover me past 21. Mm -hmm. So for families finding out um, what, what's the age limit for, for services under pediatric and adolescent care. And then if you have concerns about your son or daughter's ability to make good decisions, um, then talking about guardianship, limited guardianship, right? What, what needs to be done with time uh, in our state or anywhere to be able to get that limited guardianship set up um, before you need it. And then introducing the idea of transition to the primary care provider or the specialty provider uh, in early adolescence and, and just asking the primary care provider what, what their plan is for transition, what their, what, how they envision their role in the transition plan. And if they haven't thought about that, then at least you've started them thinking about that and you can have further conversations. Okay. Oh, yeah. ¿Qué más pueden hacer los, los padres o los guardianes? Eh, primero, pueden preguntar en la, en la práctica donde está el joven actualmente qué, qué son los límites de edad para ese proveedor eh, poder seguir viéndolos. Um, eso va a ayudar para que los papás sepan, ok, en este proveedor solamente ve niños hasta los 18 años. Entonces, pueden ir... Eh, Pasando para atrás, decir, ok, bueno, a los 13 o a los 12 vamos a estar hablando con el proveedor acerca de, de la transición, haciendo los pasos que ya habíamos platicado. El segundo es eh, hablar con su eh, seguro médico para ver si ellos tienen un límite de edad en cual ya no van a eh, pagar servicios que se dan bajo pediatría o uh, cuidado de, los, de adolescentes. Porque en, en mi práctica me ha pasado donde yo... Eh, yo estoy eh, bien viendo pacientes hasta los 26 años, pero eh, hay niños que no pueden regresar a verme porque su seguro médico dice que necesitan ver un doctor de adultos empezando a los 21 años. Um, el tercer punto es que si tienen eh, preocupaciones acerca de la habilidad de sus hijos, eh, poder hacer decisiones eh, adecuadas para su salud y su cuidado médico basado en sus necesidades eh, empezando a eh, el proceso de, de guardián, ¿verdad? De establecer eh, un guardián o, o, eh, limitado basado en lo que puede o, o no puede hacer el niño. Y lo el último es eh, 
introducir la idea de transición a, a su doctor de planta o su especialista eh, cuando el niño está en su adolescencia, es empezando los 12, 13 años, para preguntar a ese doctor qué papel van a eh, tomar en eh, planeando la transición. Y quizás nunca lo han pensado. Entonces es bueno que ellos tengan esa oportunidad de empezar a pensarlo y saber que esta familia tiene esa esperanza eh, que vamos juntos a hacer un plan de transición. I just wanted to add that one of our previous workshops, we talked about the continuum of options from guardianship to supported mm -hmm. decision making mm -hmm. and um, powers of attorney for medical. So do you, have you had any youth go through any of those processes with you? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, for sure. So I've had, uh, I, I've seen everything from full guardianship um, uh, through limited guardianship, through just um, where they, they retain, the patient retained the right to manage everything that's medical and, but not other things. And so the parents would come and they'd come to the office, the patient would come into the office to see me and the parents would sit outside uh, and not come into the office. And I would always ask the patient, I have, I've had two or three, and I just asked them, would you like your parents to come back? Two always said no, and one sometimes said yes. And so in, in every, yeah, I've kind of seen every stage. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's a really um, important thing for parents to work on so that they know and their youth knows what the expectations are, of who's going to manage what, right? Um, in my experience, de, eh, hay muchos diferentes niveles para un guardián, ¿verdad? Donde puede ser eh, que el guardián de un joven de 18 años para arriba eh, hace todas las decisiones o el guardián hace solamente algunas decisiones o en, eh, quizás en solamente una área. He tenido pacientes eh, donde los, los papás son los guardianes eh, de cosas de finanzas, pero no médicas. Entonces, el paciente viene con los papás, eh, los papás se quedan en la sala de espera, los pacientes pasan conmigo y yo siempre pregunto si quieren que los papás estén y eh, he tenido tres pacientes, dos de ellos siempre dicen no, uno a veces dice sí, a veces dice no, pero eh, eso indica la importancia de que cada familia necesita determinar eh, qué puede hacer, qué van a dejar que hacer eh, eh, su hijo o hija y ayudarlos y practicar eso antes de que se necesita hacer. I have just a comment. Um, part of this transition care should also include whether or not your person with a disability is going to be eligible for Medicaid and what that does with the providers that you're going to. So some providers will take it as a pediatric Medicaid patient, but won't take adult Medicaid at all um, or flip flop. Mm -hmm. And, um, we have a situation where my son turned 26, but he's still on our primary care insurance, mm -hmm. um, but he has Medicaid as a secondary. And so sometimes it's hard to find a, an insurer that were, or a provider that right. will be under that plan as well. Mm -hmm. And so kind of that mm -hmm. goes into what you're thinking for transitioning to healthcare providers and making sure that in your unique situation, whether your son or daughter need, has higher needs or lesser needs, what does that mean for their adult medical? Uh -huh. um, el comentario fue acerca de, de la cobertura de seguro del niño porque hay diferentes formas de Medicaid que un joven puede retener um, y no todos los proveedores aceptan eh, todo tipo de, de Medicaid. Entonces es igual importante hacer esas preguntas a los proveedores y, y porque también a veces se basa en la necesidad del niño. So finding an adult healthcare provider. So I, I think there are some priorities and this isn't an exhaustive list, but I, I think there are some things that need to be discussed uh, as you're thinking about it. Um, so the, the location of the provider and how the patient is gonna get to that provider uh, is important. You know, are they, uh, can they drive? Is, do they ride the bus? Um, if they ride the bus, is there a stop that's near there? Um, is it accessible to the patients based on their need? Are they 
uh, wheelchair or not wheelchair, you know, do they have a mobility device that's a little bit bigger? Um, does the clinic have space for that? Um, do the exam rooms have space for that? Um, is the healthcare provider associated with a preferred hospital that already knows the patient uh, or a hospital where you'd be comfortable with that patient going if needed? Um, and the healthcare provider's knowledge about the, the particular need of, of the youth, of the young adult, right? Do they have experience in, in this area? And then uh, association with specialists that you've been used to dealing with um, in pediatrics, do they have association with specialists, adult specialists in those areas? Um, in, in Buscando un Proveedor de Cuidado Adulto, las prioridades, y estas son algunas, quizás hay otras, es eh, dónde está la oficina del proveedor y qué tipo de transportación va a usar el joven. Eh, va a manejar a espacio para estacionar, eh, va a usar un, va en, en, ir en camión, hay una parada cerca de la oficina. Eh, la oficina en sí es accesible al paciente, si está en silla de ruedas o, o si tiene eh, otro modo de... de, de movilidad que quizás es un poquito más grande. Hay espacio en la oficina, hay espacio en las salas para, para el joven. Um, si ese proveedor tiene, está asociado a, al hospital donde prefiere la familia o donde ya conocen al joven. Si el proveedor tiene conocimiento acerca de las necesidades o el diagnóstico de, de ese joven. Y si el, el, el proveedor tiene una asociación con especialistas que, ha, que ya ha estado viendo el joven eh, por sus necesidades especiales. Um, good resources, and it was already brought up before, um, and I'll, I'll reinforce that, is asking other parents, just asking people who have been through the process. Um, I think they're going to be the best source because while as providers, we may know of uh, other providers we've probably never been to those providers, um, but uh, other parents have uh, and other patients have. So I included asking uh, what I'll term as self-advocates, right? What they think about the providers that they've been to and if they've found someone that they like or that they're comfortable with or they like how they uh, deal with them. Uh, discussion groups. So again, this could be online, this could be in-person parent support groups. Um, any place where people have been through the process is a, is a good place to gather information. And then, yeah, last on the list, current provider. Um, because the current providers, again, may have lists and may know of people, but again, the, the caveat is that we've actually never been to those providers. So uh, most of the time. So we just hear what we hear, oftentimes from other parents. Um, last, uh, En, en tratar de encontrar un nuevo proveedor, las cosas que puede hacer una familia o, o un joven es preguntarle a otras familias o otros jóvenes que ya han pasado por ese proceso, que conocen a otros proveedores y que les han gustado el servicio que les han dado. Um, igual en, en grupos por internet o grupos de apoyo en persona donde pueden preguntar a um, acerca de, de proveedores que trabajan bien con esta población. Luego también hablando con su, su doctor de, de planta que tienen actualmente, eh, lo difícil es que muchas veces, aunque como proveedores, quizás eh, sabemos por nombre otros proveedores que, que dicen o se nos ha dicho que um, cuidan a, a jóvenes con necesidades especiales. Realmente nunca, probablemente nunca hemos ido con esos proveedores. Nos, no los conocemos eh, de, el, al mismo nivel que otros pacientes, otras familias. Okay. So in, in finding an, an adult health care provider, I just included a, a, a few questions. And, it, and it's okay, right? It's okay to have that first doctor visit kind of be an interview. Um, I will tell you that most doctors um, aren't used to it, um, but it's totally okay. And you're, you're the consumer. And so it's, it's totally okay to ask these questions. So when you're, when you're going to a new physician or a potential new provider, sitting down with your young person and making a list of, of questions, um, if they're able to help you make that list, 
um, to see what, what they're interested in and what their concerns are. So some of the things uh, that I think are important or does that doctor currently see patients with similar health conditions, right? Does this physician have other patients with Down syndrome or CP or autism, right? And just asking them um, because that inherently has given them some experience. Um, are they willing to spend time with the previous healthcare provider to gain an understanding of your youth unique health issues? Um, and sometimes that's it, and really the most efficient way to do that is to go through that uh, healthcare summary that hopefully was already done because then the two providers can talk relatively briefly because honestly, it's very difficult to get providers to talk over the phone unless they're in the same office. Um, but that summary gives them a, a template of things to talk about so the new provider can ask questions. Um, do office visits uh, include time for that youth to talk about their concerns? or for the guardian, um, if they're unable to do that, uh, to talk about their concerns. Um, can you talk with the doctor directly over the phone? Does the doctor respond to emails? Um, can they be reached after hours? In, in a lot of cases, that's not that important. But in some cases, in, in, in youth with special health care needs, this becomes more important. It's, in, it's, it's an issue. And so you need to know that you're going to be able to reach that person when you need that person. Um, do they have social workers or case managers? Um, probably not, <laughs> but, but if you find someone that does, that's great because that tells you that they have experience with more complicated health issues, right? Because they have them help. Um, and those social workers or case managers um, are much more knowledgeable really about what's available in the community for extra services. And then does the doctor, their staff help coordinate patient care with other medical specialists? Um, en buscando un proveedor eh, para adultos se puede y se debe de hacer una entrevista con un nuevo proveedor para saber si van a encajar con ellos um, eh, lo que pueden hacer antes es sentarse con su joven para hacer una lista de preguntas para, de lo que van a preguntar a este proveedor y puede ser que, que su joven no puede dar mucha información, pero si pueden, es importante saber qué preocupaciones tienen ellos. Eh, una pregunta, se pueden preguntar al doctor si actualmente están viendo pacientes con eh, condiciones similares a lo de su joven, eh, si ellos están dispuestos a tomar tiempo con su hijo o hija, eh, con el proveedor de su hijo o hija que tenía antes para entender mejor las necesidades eh, de su hijo o hija. Um, esto funciona me mejor cuando se ha hecho ese resumen de cuidados, porque así los dos doctores pueden hablar eh, usando eh, esa información y el nuevo proveedor puede hacer preguntas basado en lo que ha, lo que ha sucedido en el pasado. Um, otra pregunta es si las, en las visitas, si hay tiempo para el joven eh, comentar y platicar acerca de sus preocupaciones o... Si usted eh, es el guardián y su hijo o hija no puede realmente hacer esas preguntas, si hay tiempo para que ustedes lo puedan hacer. Um, si el doctor está disponible eh, en teléfono, si ellos hablan directamente con familias por teléfono, si responden a eh, correos, correos electrónicos eh, directamente al paciente. Y si su doctor está disponible eh, durante las horas fuera de la oficina. En muchos casos, eh, doctores típicamente no hacen esto, algunos sí, pero en jóvenes que tienen necesidad de cuidados especiales, es importante que ellos puedan comunicarse con su doctor cuando se necesita, porque es más probable que van a necesitar ayuda eh, quizás fuera de las horas de la clínica o de otra forma. También preguntando si en la oficina del doctor tienen trabajadores sociales Um, o alguien que les puede ayudar en la coordinación de cuidados fuera de esa oficina, sea con otras especialistas o con otros terapistas o quizás para equipo médico. Y luego último, si el doctor o eh, los que trabajan en su oficina ayudan a coordinar el, el, la ayuda médica de proveedores de especialistas donde sea necesario. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I have a question for all of our attendees. Yeah. So we're all at this transition age. And my question is, has anybody who's transitioned from pediatric to adult healthcare actually gone through this process? Have the doctors facilitated this or prompted this? Because mine hasn't. <laughs> I had one doctor who left the practice and she was the first one that said, mom, I want you to sit outside. I'm going to ask your daughter these questions. And if she wants you to come in, I'll let you know. And that was the first time ever. And she has left the practice. So, okay. So go ahead, Pam. Well, our pediatricians um, prepared us, but not at age 12, but, you know, slightly started nudging more firmly at probably age 17, 18, that we're going to have to find another doctor and, and, and kind of gave us the heat of 20. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so they didn't help facilitate this. Hey, you should see no, this doctor. I'd be happy to. There was no facilitation. Um, I just went to my insurance company to find out who was in network. And I found the doctor that was closest to me. I never heard about Nevada Children's Medical Home Portal before. I would have definitely done that. But I think I lucked out and I found a really nice doctor that's very thorough. Um, we saw her. She basically started from scratch and got everything, all the information, wanted full blood workup, full, full everything. Um, and has been nothing but awesome for us. So we I switched to her too because I liked her so much. Um I don't think she has, I mean, I haven't asked her if she has other patients that have CP and autism. I think she has other patients that have autism, but she has made comments that I know that my son is more complex than anybody that she's ever dealt with. Um, and he is. And, but she she really does go out of the way to try to find the specialist that we need and probably is over careful with certain things since she doesn't know, you know. Um, Sometimes I'm like, no, this is just perfect. We're, we're okay with this. And um, she's like, well, let's test anyway. Just find <laughs> out. But um, okay. yeah, there was no transition. There was no, none of, none of this. No. I just had to find them. Yeah. Jana? Well, I was just going to say, so my experience has been a little bit different, but uh, why is it difficult for our medical community to coordinate? So, I mean, we don't have that many pediatricians in Reno that we can't provide them a list of adult providers who are willing and interested to see complex kiddos through into adulthood because not all of them are. And so I don't know why that's hard. Uh, and that's what I have. I have, ex we have experienced a lot of pushback. I've taken my daughter to a Reno orthopedic clinic. And I'm not kidding when they physically hold their, hold their hands up in the air and say, I don't know what, she, I can't see her. Can, can you, should, you should probably call Shriners. And I'm thinking she has a sprained ankle. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah. Chill out. But they, literally they're physical. Yeah. Physically no, holding I their arms up like, I can't tires. do this. But, yeah. And they, but, and they'll all, we, and nobody that, that sees the well, the ones that I've been in experience with um once they see a complex child they say their hand, hands are hands off you know like i can't i can't possibly do this and we've really struggled with that because taking her to urgent care is impossible oh, oh you know they'll, they'll call the ER and say we have to leave via ambulance when it's something we're used to dealing with every day and they assume of course that we're we're stupid parents and we don't know <laughs> what's going on so, wow. so to me, that's like, like we could fix that this weekend or within uh, yeah, a week. We could, have, <laughs> we could have a list, yep. dis, you know, disseminated to the pediatricians in town. That, you, yep. know, you have kids that are transitioning. I mean, for the whole state, like that seems like, I don't know. But then also I have a son who's in medical school at UNLV right now. And I have these kind of discussions with him just to find out like, is this, what are they teaching you? And it's 
it just shocks me that you can have physicians that go, yeah. right I, I don't know what to do and right. I'm not touching this because my son, we were fired by his inept pediatrician at three months old when she just said, I don't know what to do with him. You need to quit asking me. And luckily we had wonderful specialists in this town who had already touched base with that just said, you know, we got you, we'll get you someplace better. And but yeah, we was, had, I, we had a similar experience and they, and our first pediatrician kept telling me I was crazy. And the developmental pediatrician in town at the time said, no, no, mom's not crazy. We're doing these tests. And my daughter has catastrophic epilepsy. So I was never crazy. No. <laughs> I, I had um, a neurologist in town ask me if I was feeding my child because he looked like he was starving to death. Wow. It's good. No, I'm the final one. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We could go on for days. Right. I feel bad. How, Sorry. How much there in Vegas? Um, so let me just kind of summarize that um, in Spanish. A, se hizo la pregunta es si, otro, si otras familias han pasado por este proceso con sus eh, pediatras o sus doctores de plantas, este proceso de transición. Um, realmente los comentarios han sido que, que no, no, no ha pasado. Eh, hubo una doctora que sí habló solamente con el joven, pero fuera de eso, los demás no han tenido esa experiencia de, de, de transición, de preparación y de transición. Um, y se comentó por qué no se puede hacer una lista de doctores o especialistas que están dispuestos a ver eh, cuidar estos niños. Um, se sugirió que quizás hoy se pudiera hacer una lista de esos y se preguntó si aquí en, en Las Vegas eh, hay uh, recursos o cómo, cómo va esa transición aquí en Las Vegas. Um, so let me answer uh, just a couple of things. So I think some of the problems that we have in, in healthcare that just inherit our healthcare system is that uh, physicians don't talk to each other. And even, even specialists to primary care, uh, there's just not good communication. In, in, in pediatrics or in adult healthcare, um, the, the other issue is that because these developmental issues, you know, take your choice, CP, autism, intellectual disability, Down syndrome, whatever. These are things that a pediatrician really doesn't learn to manage until they get to residency. And in residency programs for adult medicine, it's just not taught. It might be touched on, but it's in the, in the, it's really in the experiences that the residents have in the hospital with adult patients who have these issues. And so if they didn't train in a place where a big academic health center where these types of patients are seen frequently, adult providers don't get the experience and they'll do exactly what you described. They'll throw up their hands and say, well, I don't know what to do here. You need to go to Shriners, right? Um, that's very common. That's very common here in Las Vegas as well. Um, and, and honestly, one of the, the biggest things or the biggest factors in improving that is actually having uh, a children's hospital because children's hospitals provide um, not just service for the youth, but they provide a learning center for adult physicians who are interested in taking care of these patients as they age out of pediatrics and adolescent medicine. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem. It's a big problem here too. Um, my, my patients who have transitioned to other primary care providers, I, I don't have, like, I, there's not an adult specialty of what I do. So I don't have anybody to transition them to. I, there isn't an adult behavioral developmental person. That training program doesn't exist. And in my patients, the primary care providers, their primary care providers, I've not had, though I've talked about patients with this from my perspective, they haven't had that experience with their primary care. In fact, I've had several patients that come to me as they're getting older and say, uh, my pediatrician says that th this, is, this was our last visit. And so I need to find a new provider. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> and that's a very common thing, um, unfortunately. And, and so 
there's a lot we can do. And I love the idea of families who have been through the process, who know of specialists or primary care doctors who are willing to, to see these patients. And by willing to see them, I mean willing to learn about them and learn how to take care of them. I think that would be a wonderful list uh, to make for uh, primary care providers of kids to be able to access and know where to refer these kids when they're aging out of their practices. So I like that, and I think that could live in the Family Navigation Network site. I think that's a great idea. Is there anything we could do to uh, help with the communication between doctors? I, I think the one, the single most important thing would be to suggest a visit where all you do is do the healthcare summary. I think that would that would make all the difference because then even if the two doctors don't communicate, you have information that you can take to the new provider and they're not starting from scratch because but doctors like to know what they're doing. It's not, it, it's kind of ingrained in us in our studies, like we need to know everything, which is obviously wrong, but <laughs> once they have the more information and the more comfortable they're gonna to be to move forward and say, okay, I think I can learn about this. I think I can take care of this patient with these problems. So that, yeah, that summary I'd say is the number one thing you could do. Okay, thank you. Can I add to that too? So Nevada's, Southern Nevada is working on bringing a dedicated children's hospital and the ded dedicated children's healthcare network to Nevada, it, the whole of Nevada. And um, I'm on the board for a group called Act for Kids Nevada. And what our goal is, is to start getting people aware that we need this. We need it done now. It's a five to eight year process. We need to start talking to legislators. You can go to Act for Kids Nevada um, on our socials and put in your experiences. But what I think also is great about that is bringing those, that communication piece into focus. So we can work on the communication piece in pediatrics before we actually have a children's hospital, but the goal is actually to get that. And then once we have a children's hospital to provide mobile services out to rural Nevada, um, because pediatrics in Nevada currently, there's 267 pediatricians and over 600,000 children in youth. <laughs> So uh, we know that there's a lot of places where specialties, it's not, there's not even primary care and specialties and subspecialties are just non-existent, but bringing that piece um, together to offer not just primary care, but children's mental behavioral health out mm -hmm. to the counties and rural Nevada. Yes. So big problem, but yes. we're working on it here. Please join us if you feel like you are able to contribute to your, your voice and your support to bringing a children's hospital to Nevada. Um, hey, Lisa, would you please repeat the website or the... Uh, yeah, it's called Act for Kids with the, the number four, Act for Kids all together, Act for Kids NV. And you can find us on Linktree. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook. There isn't a website right now. We're working on developing it. And we are... Um, encouraging people from Northern Nevada to become part of it because it will help the whole of Nevada instead of having to go to Stanford for advanced specialties and subspecialties, you'll be able to come to Southern Nevada and then eventually we have some in Northern Nevada as well. Half the distance to Stanford. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. We have, we have one more question over here. So this children's hospital that you're hoping to bring to Nevada, is that a freestanding children's hospital that's different than Sunrise Children's? And it is. And the reason why is the freestanding, free um, Dr. Gaspar Diaba has mentioned that one of the things that they do is they talk to each other. So if you go in for an appointment, let's say you go to Children's Hospital LA for neurology, you go get your labs done. And by the time you're back up in the office, they're already the results are already delivered to the to that referring physician. You see maybe um, six specialists in a day in one building versus in Southern Nevada anyway, you're going like this all over the place. So it coordinates care in a, in a way that makes sense for children, but it also 
takes into effect the whole child and what do you do with the siblings while you're at appointments and everything. So I can talk for hours about it. I will not take up any more time, but uh, please join Act for Kids Nevada and um, my, my organization, Down Syndrome Connections Las Vegas. You can reach me through my website too if you wanna to talk to me directly. Lisa, would you mind if in my re my uh, follow-up email to this conference, um, I put your email address? Absolutely, it's my name or Down Syndrome Connections, um, Down Syndrome Connections LV at gmail.com. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Entonces, hablando o resumiendo lo que se ha hablado, um, las necesidades de, de un niño en este proceso de transición eh, donde los papás o los guardianes pueden ayudar como ya se ha platicado eh, porque no está pasando entonces muchas veces los, los pacientes eh, especialmente en mi oficina vienen y me dicen que su pediatra les dijo ya fue la última cita y están buscando otro doctor entonces si en, el, en su proveedor actual de su hijo no están platicando acerca de esto, es una buena tema de introducir para que ellos sepan que la familia tiene esa esperanza, ¿verdad? Que, que va a haber un proceso y para que les empiezan a ayudar. Se mencionó también que en, en, el, en el proceso de, de buscar un proveedor, eh, muchas veces los proveedores de adultos no tienen experiencia porque en sus estudios no se les enseñó cómo cuidar pacientes que han tenido este tipo de problema desde, desde chiquitos. Entonces, no tienen esa educación o experiencia. Entonces, eh, en lugares donde hay hospitales especialmente para niños, se, es más fácil encontrar porque esos hospitales no solamente ofrecen los servicios, pero también ofrecen oportunidades educativas para doctores de adultos, para que ellos pueden venir y aprender y estar más cómodos en el tratamiento de esos jóvenes. Um, se preguntó también qué, qué se pudiera hacer para mejorar la comunicación entre los proveedores de niños y los proveedores de adultos. Eh, lo que dije fue, si hay una cosa, es crear ese resumen de cuidados médicos de su, su proveedor actual para que ese resumen pueda ir a su nuevo doctor, porque el nuevo doctor va a ser más eh, confortable, más a gusto en cuidar a su hijo, al joven, si tienen ese resumen y tienen esa información, entonces no van a estar empezando de cero, van a tener una idea de lo que ellos deben de estar haciendo con ese niño. Se comentó también que se está intentando establecer un hospital para niños aquí en Las Vegas. Um, hay una organización de apoyo para tratar de que se haga ese hospital en 5 o 8 años eh, y ese, esa, ese contacto va a estar en el resumen que se mande con este esta conferencia. So, yeah. Um, this, this page, so I, this page is in your packets, um, and this is for the youth. There's another similar one. Uh, I didn't include it, but it's also in your packet for uh, the parents, family members, guardians, right? To, just to check the things that, that you can start doing at certain ages to facilitate the process um, with the current providers. Uh, to help work through it with them so that it actually happens. <laughs> and like anything else, the more it happens, the more they get used to it and the more it'll happen. So uh, these are great, these are great forms. Um, in, in su paquete eh, hay dos eh, hojas de información, eh, uno para jóvenes, otro para los papás o los guardianes, donde hay pasos que pueden hacer a ciertas edades para ayudar a su hijo a hacer esa transición. Y claro que, que cada, cada niño va a tener sus, sus necesidades específicas y quizás no van a poder todas las cosas que están aquí, pero deben de intentar de hacer las cosas que pueden hacer. So because these forms are fairly general, there's obviously going to be things that some youth are not going to be able to do at that age, and, and that's okay. But you can look at the things that they might be able to do and try them. Um, to help them through the, the transition. Okay. There's a, did you want to go through the questionnaire? Um, we'll to fill it out today. Oh, is that your last Yeah, letter? that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments or anything? 
Okay. Well, thank you. I hope it was helpful. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mario. Um, for the last five or 10 minutes, we have this, uh, I don't know if you can all see this, but transition readiness assessment for parents and caregivers of youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Here, it's in your folder if you are present. Uh, I emailed it if you are on Zoom. And I'd like you to take just five or 10 minutes to fill this out and it will really get you started thinking about where your youth stands today with transition and how you can support them in the handful of years to come. So go ahead and get that out. And Maria, I'll just add too that um, Mario has given us another questionnaire similar to that, that um, we're gonna get an electronic copy of that you can send out as an additional handout. Excellent, thank you. Marcia, would you put the survey slide up for me, please? <laughs> Before people start heading out, Marsha's gonna put up a QR code here for just a survey so that we can always do better. So if you wouldn't mind scanning that with your phone, if you've got to head out.
Thank you all for coming. Take as much time as you need on that. Um, be sure to keep the gottransition.org website in your back pocket. It is full of transition, healthcare transition information that is so helpful. And um, always feel free to reach out if you if you realized you had some extra questions and we can send them to Mario and he'd be happy to help. Um, Marsha, if you'd put up the, the next sessions that are coming up that you can sign up for, that would be great.